Okay, so just about 10 seconds till our live stream starts. Thank you, everybody, for being part of this. We really appreciate it. We're happy to have you. And in this webinar, we're going to go over the Gen 2 products. So we're really excited about this. We think it's going to be fun. Uh, I have Matt Davis here, our lead engineer. Hi, hey, everybody. Um, so thank you all for joining. We have a chat that you guys can use um, to ask us questions during the live stream. We're going to try to go as fast as possible so that we can answer all of the questions that everybody has. And, you know, so you guys are busy, so we're going to go as fast as possible to try to get um, the entire um, portfolio, you know, talked about. So we've got a lot of ex exciting stuff. Uh, we actually have a slot machine that we're going to be using to determine which feature we're going to go over <laughs> first. Uh, so that should be kind of fun. You guys probably got a chance to look at it just a little bit there. Um, so let's get started. So the first uh, thing we wanted to mention is the fact that we are going to be, uh, they are shipping today. So the Gen 2 products are shipping, and that's, a good, uh, that's good news. So if you've purchased a PTZ Optics camera within the last 60 days, you probably already have a Gen 2 mo model. Yeah. So what can these Gen 2 models do? Um, we are going to go over that right now. And the very first feature that we are going to go over will be... Not H.264. <laughs> not 3G SDI. H.265. Okay, so we're going to go over H.265 first, and Matt's going to go over a little bit about H.265 and what that will mean. So, Matt, you want to kind of explain H.265 a little bit? Yeah, so. What that means? A lot of you are probably very familiar with H.264. You probably see it all over the place, video files, streaming terms. Um, you know, it's been a great, great way to compress data uh, and send it. However, now we've got H.265, which takes it even further. So you're going to be able to pump that same video signal using substantially less data over your network, which means that you could have more cameras on your network, uh, you could have a network dedicated that now can allocate more video devices to it that are all using H.265. Um, and the other thing to think about is now as image sensors start to get larger with 4K, 60 frames a second, 120 frames a second, uh, you're going to start being able to pump that down that same old pipeline and not worry about causing network jitters. So yeah, that, this is a really big feature and it, it really uh, strives towards the future of where we're taking this camera line. You know, we know that IP workflows are becoming the future. We know that uh, more cameras are being put on the network, and we knew that we had to come up with a way to reduce the bandwidth. Exactly. So, um, Matt, we have a, um, a little chart here that shows the difference between H.264 and H.265. So, what I wanted to do is kind of talk to you, maybe if you could walk us through the differences here between, and I'll take this chart full screen for those of you who can't see it uh, that well, um, the differences here. Yeah, so Motion JPEG was really where, um, not the very beginnings, but the first commercial beginnings really uh, for the streaming video. And what you're getting there, kind of like the name suggests, MJPEG for Motion JPEG, uh, you're literally getting a still JPEG image uh, for your frames. Unfortunately, this can be CPU intensive, this is bandwidth intensive. Um, you know, if you need something that hasn't been tampered, hasn't been compressed, you want to use it for editing, Motion JPEG is wonderful. Um, but it's not the most efficient way to transmit data in this modern world. Um, so as you go down that line, MPEG-2 was a way where they compressed the video. Um, not quite in half, but very close. Uh, and then you have H.264, MPEG-4, they all kind of fall into the same similar containers. Uh, yet again, you've halved it almost again. Uh, and as you can see going into the high efficiency video codec for H.265, yet again we're seeing the same thing occur. Uh, so as you might uh, see there, we've got a nice little slope, a trending line that's occurring um, where the future will head. That's a whole other exciting thing. Yeah, so we've got MJPEG on there, so that should help you guys kind of understand uh, the next feature. Now, we've got to use our slot machine to see which feature we're going to go to next, but I think it might be that. Let's see. Um. Ooh. Oh. oh, not quite the there. SDI. Hey. Hey. <laughs> 
not coincidental. <laughs> <laughs> so MJPEG we're going to talk about next. Um, let's go ahead and get into MJPEG. And what, it's, you think you know, it's, it's, it takes up more bandwidth. So why would we want to use MJPEG? Yeah, so what this has become a lot more popular, you've got a lot of people where you may be streaming out to YouTube Live, Joycaster, the list kind of goes on and on. Um, and you typically are doing that using H.264. Uh, Motion JPEG, on the other hand, is a great way to do a local dump of your video content. So you're not trying to stream to the outside world, you're not caring as much about the bandwidth because in all reality, your network most likely, in most instances, can handle Motion JPEG dumping to an FTP server, uh, local hard drives to a PC nearby. Um, you know, it's really a way to have editable content. So if you maybe were doing a live stream but wanted to do post-production for advertising, things like that, it's a really easy way to capture a really high-quality stream from the camera. Um, but yet again, not really meant for, for traditional streaming purposes. Cool. All right. So that that's our our feature um, MJPEG feature again. It looks like we have a question here, Matt. If you yeah. want to answer that. So there, the question is: uh, any improvement on sensor noise? Uh, I see you're probably using VMix for your webinar, and the key is very rough and blocky. This is the same problem we are having. Um, so I, you know what? Uh, take a take a second. Uh, I, I actually noticed that, and I adjusted the key, um, and I think I got it a little better. Um, whoop, now we're completely gone, but I think I have the key, it is a little noisy. I think I have the key just about right, but yeah, there is a little noise. Yeah, I mean, so for our instance in particular, I would say the fact, even though you guys can't see it here, uh, our green screen surface might not be the most taut. Um, we definitely have some curves and waves and edges going on, so that is definitely impacting the quality. Um, if we were able to, um, uh, you know, get this a little tauter, ours would be a little bit better. Um, but sometimes it's the distance in between, things like that, uh, really can make a huge difference for you. Um, the other thing is, uh, we I think I got it just about right now, where the noise is almost imperceivable. Now we are live streaming in 1080p, um, so you know, if, if we were in 720, it'd probably be less noticeable. But you're right. Okay, so um, the next question is, he's intrigued that we um, are invested so much in improving the IP footprint of the camera. However, the lack of DHCP support is a showstopper. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the largest majority of our clients want to static these. Um, we haven't had too much request for the DHCP. It is something that we are working on to release as a firmware for these Gen 2s. Um, but that was definitely not the focus uh, based on you know, the feedback we'd receive from clients. So what we really try to do is take that feedback and prioritize based off of what everybody's telling us. So it is something that is currently in the works uh, for the Gen 2 line specifically. Um, but yeah, our focus was getting the H.265 and Motion JPEG up and running uh, due to specific market segment requests. Yeah, that MJPEG one was just surprisingly a lot of uh, people want to stream MJPEG as a backup so that th at the end of their live stream, they've got this really high quality, uncompressed video coming off it. And looks like we have a question about that. With MJPEG, can we assume that Wirecast can see the source camera without any delay or small delay? Um, it's a small delay. Um, it's definitely not going to be a zero delay, uh, as nice as that would be. Uh, an ultimate dream there. Uh, but um, yes, the delay is extremely low at the moment. Um, we are also looking at eventually, eventually releasing as a firmware update. Currently, you can do a mix of an H.264 stream or an H.265 stream. If you set it to Motion JPEG at the moment, it's currently only Motion JPEG. Uh, we are looking to release a firmware update that will allow you to do an H.264 stream, H.265 stream at the same time as you're doing a motion JPEG stream. So, um, yes, and we'll answer all questions that come through the chat. Hopefully, we'll, this will be an informative webinar for everyone. Let's go to our next feature. So we have to use our slot machine. MJPEG, wide dynamic range, no? Um, Phil asked, will the DHCP support be added via firmware update or a new camera? Um, 
just to answer it real quick, it's going to be for the Gen 2 line only, and it would be a firmware update. Okay, so we are going to talk about wide dynamic range next, which is a, a really cool um, topic, and uh, we haven't talked about it. We've got a lot of features to talk about, but wide dynamic range is something that we've greatly improved on the cameras, and I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about it. Yeah. So, Matt, if you want to kind of explain, we have some test shots here um, that we took in our office, so maybe I'll make this full screen so we can show it off. Uh, Matt, wh what is wide dynamic range and why would it be important? Yeah, so wide dynamic range really comes into play when you have some tough lighting situations. Um, the graphic that Paul's showing here really does a really good job of kind of showcasing what wide dynamic range brings to the table. So the top shot is without wide dynamic range enabled. And as you can see, we're literally, we've got a vestibule with light pouring into it and as a result, your entire surrounding area um, you know, becomes dark. It, it doesn't know how to handle the different areas with different lighting scenarios. So as you're playing with the wide dynamic range and increasing its capabilities, what you end up with is an image where all the colors are coming through, where the details are coming through. It's processing the light areas and the dark areas separately um, so that you actually get that quality that you're after. Um, and this is also then where uh, in these images the noise reduction, like 2D and 3D noise reduction, will come into play to help clean up that image. Yeah, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, this 2D and 3D noise cancellation um, f uh, lar large here for a second, because um, what you can see here is that, that where we started was that first top left. Then we added the noise reduction to about 60%. Then in the bottom left, we've added wide dynamic range. And then in the bottom right, we've added uh, wide dynamic range with 60% noise reduction. And that's 2D and 3D noise yeah. uh, reduction. Uh, you ca it, I wish these pictures were a little better, a little larger, but you can see in the wood grain on the side and the paneling on the side that, that the noise cancellation inc with the wide dynamic range really is the best. Image. Yeah. So we will be, we're going to be working, um, you know, this gives you an idea of what it is. We are going to be working on our, for our PTZ Optics YouTube channel. You should see some content soon. Uh, in high quality that will showcase so that you can sit there and take a peek at what it's really doing as, as these updates are changed, or I mean as these uh, features are enabled. So we don't have to go to the slot machine anymore. Um, we've, we've already kind of got all of, our, all of our fun out with that. Um, the ne actually, we, we do have one more. We, we've got one more slot machine image where we're going to take a look at the last, where is that? Here it is, last one, guys. Our last feature update is going to be keep teasing us with it. What's it gonna be? 3G SDI. This was a big one. Uh, so many people were asking about it. We had to do it. Uh, before our Gen 2 models, they were only 1080p 30. Now they're 1080p 60. Um, we looks like we have a question in the chat. Um, looks like you got uh, John had a Gen 2, wh which was uh, which he delivered for a client. That's great. You might not have even known you were getting a G2. Um, we've been shipping them for about 60 days now, um, and they're 3G SDI. So that has solved a lot of problems for our customers. Um, a lot of times, uh, different uh, broadcast equipment can't accept, you know, 1080p 30. They need 1080p 60. Um, and that was a huge request for us, and we, we've brought it up, especially for those of you who are new tech dealers. Um, you know, new tech when they came to us, you know, wanting to integrate with us, they said, "Look, guys, you got to do 1080p 60. That's becoming the broadcast standard, yeah. and that's where we are today." Yeah, we're live streaming right now in 1080p 30, um, and I want to do some 1080p 60 testing with YouTube Live because I know it is possible. Yeah. Um, but currently, um, 1080p. Uh, 30 is what we're live streaming in, but it seems like television, broadcast, sports, all of those enjoy uh, 1080p 30 resolutions. We've got a little chart here. Again, I'm going to take this large because it's probably a little hard to see. Um, this is the, the HD SDI layers uh, in which you can, the, the levels of HD SDI, and you can see here, make this large, that it kind of starts with just regular HD SDI which is 720p or 1080i and uh, technically it could also be you know 1080p 30 I think is just regular SDI or HD SDI. 
Um, if you're doing the, yeah, there are ways, yeah. But as you can see here, the 3G SDI, which was actually introduced in 2006, is 1080p 60. So uh, we don't go up to 2160. Is that 2K? Uh, that, that would be, yeah, it's somewhere in between. It's, it's hard to K. They, they would call it 4K, most likely. Okay. So it looks like you can potentially do 4K over um, HD SDI cabling. Um, but we are only doing a 1080p 60 over HD SDI. Now, Matt, uh, with the HD SDI, does that also include uh, eight, uh, via HDMI and via USB? Uh, for via the 60? IP? Yeah. So the, the only spot uh, that the 60 frames does not come through currently is in the web streaming. OK. So uh, everything else, though, is 60 frames. So that means uh, we could do 1080p 60 over USB which a lot of our customers are using USB and plugging it right into a computer with vMix or right into a computer with Wirecast. So if you need to do 1080p60, we would be able to do that. Yeah. Of course, you would need a USB 3.0 port. Yes. And probably, definitely, a quad-core processor. Yeah, not even a computer. question. No questions. That. No dual-core computers can handle that 1080p60. Um, question on how to buy from Brazil. Um, we have a, a distributor in Latin America called Tech Exporters. If you fill out our contact information, we'll get you in touch with them. They do all our importing for Latin America. And um, HDMI 1080p60, so a lot of HDMI TriCasters. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe the vMix Go supports HDMI anymore. Now they just have the SDI I think version. So. Yeah. so you'd have to use uh, HD SDI for the vMix hardware um, pieces. But yeah, that's the 3G SDI. The other thing I wanted to mention is the dual streaming. Mm -hmm. So from what I understand, Matt, you can do H.264 or H.265 dual, but with the MJPEG, because it's so much bandwidth, you can only do a single stream? At the moment, yes. Um, we do have a way where we're going to be enabling at least H.264 and Motion JPEG, and in all reality, most likely H.265 and Motion JPEG as well. Um, but yeah, currently you could do you know, dual streaming with the H.264 and H.265, Motion JPEG will limit you to a single stream on the Gen 2 line for now. Okay. Okay, so that, so we do have the dual streaming. So, you know, I can see people using that for sending a low quality stream to somewhere, a uh, high quality stream. Um, you know, for those of you who have been looking at our last live stream about the NewTek NDI, you could live stream to a VLC player. And now NewTek has a VLC to NDI plugin you could use as a source. Um, so currently, Bob, Bob Good Video is asking about the NewTek NDI. Um, take yeah. a look at our last um, live stream, all about the NewTek NDI apps. There's about, I would say, almost 10 different ways that you can take our cameras, plug them into a computer, a TriCaster, or a different piece of hardware, and make them an NDI source available on your network. It's not built into our cameras. No, no, we are we are looking at NDI, but at the moment, um, you know, we have nothing nothing to talk about. So net, this Friday, actually, we're going to be showing the NDI on a TriCaster. We've got the TriCaster Mini. We're going to show, and uh, there's going to be some interesting things going on. Like for example, one of our customers actually took the HDMI output of our PTZ Optics camera and split it. They sent one to the PTZ, or sorry, one to the TriCaster and one to a capture card where they installed the NDI Connect app, which is basically an app that takes an input and makes it NDI available. Then he took both inputs side by side and recorded them. And it looks like there's zero latency at all. We had to take that video into a video editor and then look at it frame by frame to see if there was any latency at all. So this Friday, we're going to be showing that off. We're also going to be showing off, hopefully, if we can pull this off, one HDMI into a TriCaster, and then the USB model, which is also live at 1080p60, into a computer. And then we're going to use the NDI Connect app, which allows you to uh, turn a basically a virtual NDI webcam over the network. And we're going to record them side by side and see what the latency is. But so far, it's been fairly minimal. Yeah, surprisingly low. Um, we also had a question here. Uh, what about the ability to work with all the camera settings via the web interface? We have enabled some more, uh, some additional settings via the web interface, 
but everything that you can do from the on-screen display menu is not entirely there yet. Yes. Um, so, like, H.265 is now there. Uh, multicast is now there. Um, the dual streaming, the MJPEG is now there. So if you've ever logged into a PTZ Optics camera, basically you give it a static IP address, you type that IP address into the web browser, and it pulls up the interface of the camera. Now that interface has a password, a username and password, which you can set so that just for security, once you log in, you've got all the information for pan, tilt, and zoom right over your network, calling presets, setting the, the preset speeds and everything, the camera speeds, and then you can go in and set up all your RTSP um, streaming information. Yeah. So that's, that's where all that is. Um, looks like John has done some testing with vMix uh, and saying the RTSP you know, decoding right in vMix is actually fairly well. I believe it's also been improved with H.265. And you can do some buffering. Mm -hmm. So you, you, if you want the lowest latency possible, you just remove all buffering to zero. And uh, it should be, depending on your network, fairly, um, fairly low latency. So with vMix 17, as you all know, a lot of the information is a little mysterious until the real yeah. official announcement. Um, but at least from images that you can see on their own blogs, things like that, um, you will see some basic pan, tilt, and zoom controls, um, and I believe some preset controls as well. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. You know, uh, what, what vMix is doing is, is really, you know, they haven't shown us anything except for what we've seen on their live streams. In fact, what they're saying is that the, the beta of vMix 17 is going to be available Monday of NAB. So, and speaking of NAB, I'll just show you guys our booth really quickly. Um, so behind us, this is our booth for NAB. So this is where we want to set up everything and show off the uh, vMix 17. So right behind us over here, over there, hard to point into the virtual set, is a green screen there. So we're actually going to have a vMix area specifically for vMix. And then we're going to have a TriCaster area and a Wirecast area. And the idea is to show off vMix 17, but Martin won't give it to us mm -hmm. until... Uh, until the official release, so we don't get it any earlier than anyone else. It's still kind of a mystery uh, exactly uh, what, what it's going to be capable of fully. We're not exactly sure. So let's see. What else do we have, Matt? So we hmm. talked about 3G SDI. We talked about H.265 versus H.264. Uh, we talked about MJPEG. Yep. Uh, we gave a little preview of our NAB booth, yep. um, which is you know going to be really excited. This was something I wanted to show uh, a, li a little, um, just, just really quickly. This is called a marketing bell curve. And what this is, is it's basically um, determining, it's just what marketers use to determine, you know, where in the live streaming market are we today? And I feel like today for live streaming, we're really in the innovator stage, um, maybe the early adopter stage. But I think it's very, very quickly going to jump to the early majority. And I think it's going to be six to nine months. Um, if you look at the Trump rallies that they're live streaming, you look at um, the Grammys that they're live streaming, the brands like um, GoPro yeah. and Kohl's that are jumping on the live stream bandwagon, this is going to happen really fast. I was watching NBC last night, and they were saying that um, you know, broadcasters are having trouble keeping up with the live streamers. And it's becoming an actual problem for, uh, for the television industry, that the whole television industry could have an issue uh, with just keeping up with live streamers. So I, I don't know where you, how you guys feel. Maybe you could tell us in the chat um, what you guys think. Um, but we think it's, it's still very early days for the live streaming market. And I think that it'll really become true at NAB. That's where we'll really get some great insight from all the people we talk to, how they're using live streaming, what kind of projects they're getting into. But I think it's really early days. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I kind of feel like we're in that early adopters, very quickly moving into that early majority territory at this point. We're certainly not in the late majority. No. Um, I, I really think it's, it's almost innovators. It, it, it's very, very close to early adopters. And then it's just going to explode to early majority because of all the free solutions out there. Microsoft just released Skype for business, Skype for meetings, live streaming, Something their own thing. Yeah. Uh, Google Hangouts on Air. I mean, all of these things add up to becoming a really big snowball effect that's going to happen. Now, for those of you who don't know, we also serve the video conferencing industry with our USB conferencing cameras. 
This market is a little bit more developed, and it's, it's probably in the early majority stage. You know, pretty much everybody is using video conferencing now. Yeah, yeah, I'd say, you know, it, it's definitely, it has migrated beyond those uh, standards-based codecs that cost a fortune. Um, you know, and we're starting to see as a result of that, that barrier being broken down, um, people starting to implement it anywhere they can. Um, so, yeah, we're definitely... We're starting to see it finally blossom like it always needed to. <laughs> so we just, I just wanted to show these two slides to just give people an idea of where we think the market's headed. Um, you know, these are the two markets that we strive in um, and we'll be talking about at NAB and Infocom, the two trade shows that we're going to be at. So keep an eye on those markets. Um, that's where we think they are today. Um, that's really everything we have. Um, we really wanted to appreciate all, all 35 of you, 39 of you that were able to to, to watch the live stream. Um, it's been a fun, it's been fun. Uh, if there's any last questions, we'll go ahead and answer them. And if not, we'll let you guys uh, tune in to this Friday, if you're interested. We're going to a live stream with the new Tech NDI with the TriCaster Mini that we have. Last Friday, we did the new Tech NDI apps overview. And then uh, in the next coming weeks, we've got some other exciting interviews. One of them is going to be with Joycaster. Yeah. So if you haven't checked out Joycaster, take a look. They allow you to send one live stream to them, and then they redistribute it to up to eight CDNs. We should be doing it now, but I always forget to set it up. It looks like Todd's going to be at NAB. Uh, All right, great. I guess we'll we, see you there then, Todd. I hope, at least. <laughs> schedule a meeting with us. we got a nice big booth. We're excited to have, uh, have as part of it. It's, that's it right there. Yeah, do we know what uh, the number is, the booth number? The booth number is um, on our website. Uh, it's, it's, it's 13909, I believe. Okay. Um, but let me just double check it real quick. It is 13909. So we are in the South Hall. 13909. And, um, mm -hmm. and the South Hall is right where VMix is. It's right where TriCasters are, the new tech booth, the Wirecast booth, Black Magic, Grass Valley. All those guys are right in the South Hall. Um, so... It should be fun. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining. We yeah. appreciate your time. It's always fun. Enjoy. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.